you know, so I don't have my glasses on. When, when, I'm, when I'm up close and personal, I take them off because it's almost like it's too magnified. It gives me almost like a headache. I mean, I, kind of, I, mean, I can see what I can see up close. You know, I don't need to see you any closer. Yeah. But if I'm watching TV or something like that, I better have them on. But uh, I haven't got to the point where I have to have them on to read yet. But even though it did decline, it's, I think I'm getting there. I think that she's trying to tell me that yeah. yesterday. But anyway, so. Here's the thing, man. Once you get started on it, like once you, I don't know, once, once, once you go the nasty route, then you start with the ones. And then, then, you look, and then you get the 1.5s. And then you get the twos. And well, it's all downhill from there. But mm. here's the best thing about my gig is since I travel so much. The, I, I never shop for these ever because I find them in the seat back in front of me on the airplane. Mm. So you, I've got got, a whole, you got a collect, collection? <laughs> Most of it have like a pearly chain <laughs> <laughs> or they're like roses, little gold roses. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I'll hang them around my neck. I'm, uh, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not too uh, proud. All right, man. So uh, here's the thing, man. We're going to have a good time. We're going to talk about it all. We're going to cover everything. And um, we are going to cover um, what you are doing at Magnolia High School. We're going to talk about um, uh, all that went into the foundation of, of, of cre- all that went into the creation of the foundation that you've built your career on. Mm. Because uh, here's, here's, here's what I know is um, great stuff doesn't just happen Mm. it's it's a combination of people who really think through what they're doing they have a strategy and also they've had some mentors Mm. and they have some people they've observed along the way both good and bad and um, based on those observations they've decided to do you know do do their life a little bit different than some other folks do more intentionally and deliberately and i think that's what you have going on man and i think the evidence uh shows every day over there at the uh, mhs the, the M.A. The, <laughs> I want to make yeah, sure I get the right, the, right. the MHS in there. Before you know it, man, there's going to be like three or four more of those high schools going up out there. I know. It's I know. crazy. I know. Yeah, they crazy. bought the property for a third one. Really? But it's, you know, with Exxon, all that stuff coming, supposedly uh-huh. we're going to boom. You know it. Yeah. All yeah. Right. I'm not sure if you'll be around for all that. No. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Might have to go on the road. Yeah, that's the thing. All right, Teach Like a Rockstar podcast. Here we go. First of all, for all you teachers that are sending me those emails, I know. I know it's been a while. I had a uh, couple weeks off, and uh, but we're back in now. We, we've been averaging one or maybe two a week, and then I guess people, they, they get mad when, you, when you, we quit putting them out there. Where's the next one? So here it is. It's today. We have Jeff Springer in the house. We're going to talk about all things education because here's what i've learned there's one person on the planet that has the answers to everything he's sitting right here mm. it's just a, mm. <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um and, and uh, we're gonna get some answers today we're gonna figure out a lot about education and kids so here we go let's do this thing teaching a rock star podcast we are officially rolling here we go Okay, we are coming down to the end of summer. Can you believe it? I go out. Um, I'm leaving on uh, Monday to do my first back-to-school in-service. Toloso Midway, Corpus Christi, I'm coming for you. And then I'm doing the Culture and Caring Conference in El Paso, Texas. We'll be keynoting that on Thursday of next week. I have a week off, and then I'm back on the road. Bells. Uh, elementary school in Bells, Tennessee, then Prestonburg, Kentucky, East Kentucky. Love it. Right right next to Betsy Lane High School. I've been to Betsy Lane a couple of times. I love those people out there. Amazing things. And uh, man, I'm going to tell you a good story about Betsy Lane. And, um, and I can't wait to come see you guys. Listen, we have a couple of dates left. Those two weeks, those last couple of weeks of August, I saw, uh, I was looking yesterday because I saw some interesting things on Facebook. Ivan Reyes, let me give you a shout out, brother. You've been promoted to the assistant principal 
at Kemp High School. Way to go, brother. And um, and I'll tell you what, who made a great decision down over there was uh, Big Sammy Swartz, the the superintendent, who was the football coach at Pettis, where I started. This is a, you know how, education's a small mm, world, man. It is, a network. And, uh, and so Big Sammy Swartz was a football coach, slash counselor, slash, slash gardener, slash transportation you know how it is in small mm. schools he did everything and peggy swartz was um everything for girls uh uh coach and she was also sort of the assistant band director with me and um and now they're out in camp he's the superintendent and ivan reyes and listen i looked at your calendar and uh out there in camp you've got a couple of dates uh that uh for your for back to school that i have open just saying Keep that in mind. And all right, so here we are, man. Um, uh, Jeff Springer, let, let me give you a um, let me give you uh, some insight on how uh, I got to know about you. So I started at uh, Cy Springs High School mm. and in Cy Fair ISD, and I started. I, I'm not good with years, but I, it was the second year the school was open. So Alan Meek was still the principal. So about um, 97. Ish. Yeah, ish. Yeah. Yeah. And you were in the district. I was. Yeah. And uh, you were the associate principal somewhere, weren't yeah, you? I was at Jersey Village. Jersey took, Village. Took Sarah Hardy's place. Who, right. Who moved with Alan. So Alan and Sarah came to Open Size Springs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. along with her. Uh, Barbara Wyman was on staff and mm-hmm. Kim McCown and a whole bunch. A whole, Good group. Yeah. Awesome group. Let me tell you, man, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Barbara Crook was a mm-hmm. DI. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal. We still yeah. keep in touch. And, um, and, uh, so it was our, my first year there and we were driving up there. They, there was a, it was administrators and me, I'm not sure how I got on this crew. It was me, <laughs> Alan was driving, Sarah was in the passenger, I'm in the back seat, and we're going up to Conroe to study their, uh, ninth grade, the, the way they run their ninth grade mm-hmm. initiative grant. And they were doing some interesting things. We went to look at that. There's a couple of the carloads of administrators and, um, and they're talking, and then your name comes up, and they say, "How don't don't you know Springer?" Mm. And I said, "No." And they and like they both turned around and looked at me like, "How could we 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 thought you guys were friends?" I said, "I don't, I don't I've never heard mm. of them." And then so maybe uh, six weeks go by, and then I'm talking to uh, Sandra Coffee, who is the science department chair and she and your name comes up in conversation and she goes and she goes that's house friend and i said I don't, I, I, don't, I don't even know this guy who is he and then it happened a couple more times and then so finally i'm thinking well let me figure this out and then i realized and that that's when you moved to Ma- the magnolia high school mm-hmm. except for the principal position over there and i thought i wonder who that guy is and so that that became like i can mm-hmm. figure out who this mm-hmm. guy is and so you moved uh from sci fair to the Magnolia High School, and man, you guys are killing it over there. We're getting there. We've been there in 2002. Right. This first year. 2002, and here we are in 20... So this is your... This will be going into your 12th year. 12th year. Man. Yeah, time. amazing. Time flies. Amazing, yeah. 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 A lot of changes. All right, and so and so, let's get the big thing out of the way, brother. You were... This is, this is the award. This is the big one this mm. year, was the Texas High School Principal of the Year. Mm, state of Texas, wow! I can't even I can't even fathom it. You want, you want I to tell eat? people I'm not even the best principal in my building. <laughs> I'm, I, mean, I mean, how did that happen? How does that happen? That's all. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. What, what do you have? About, we have about, about what couple thousand schools in Texas. How many schools in Texas? Well, there's. I know that we have 5,500 members in TASSP, which is the all Texas right. Association of Secondary School Principals, which is the association that recognized me. Okay. So 11, 1,100 school districts. Right, so, as I was thinking, twelve mm, like 11, yeah. 12 school districts, mm. thousands and thousands. Mm. This is a huge state, man. Mm. Thousands of schools. Yeah. And somehow they put all those principals into the funnel, mm. and one pops out the bottom. Mm. It's you. Somebody has to carry the banner. <laughs> so I'll carry it. I'll yeah. Carry it. The, ride, the ride is just about over. Uh-huh. So, but uh, it's been fun. Yeah. I am so blessed. It's, it's such a huge award, you know. Mm. All right, so let, let's go. So what we do is we always Tarantino this thing. So we, there's kind of the end. You're at, you're at Magnolia High School. You guys are doing amazing things. And we'll get to some of those details and the principal of the year and, and all that went into that. But let, let's let's go way back. And um, tell me about, so so did you grow up here in Texas? I did. Well, we moved from Ohio when mm-hmm. I was in the fifth grade. And I started in the Spring Branch School District. And then I 
moved to Cypher ISD, Cypher High School as a sophomore. So I'm a, and I was in that, I kind of grew up in that district, not only as a student, finished my high school career, mm -hmm. and then went away to college, came back, taught, um, opened Watkins Junior High, brand new, under Bo Favor yeah. in 82. Um, was in the district a total of 19 years. Bo Favor, I was the principal? Uh-huh. Uh, 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 no, I don't know, but is he an uh, ex-football coach? I'm sure. You have to be both. Oh, Bo Bo come on. Man. He was a great guy. Great guy. Yeah. Had a lot of patience for a brand new teacher. <laughs> so. And, and so um, not to rush through it too quick. So in um, in in school, when when you're in school, you're an athlete. Mm -hmm. And um, well, and I played. <laughs> <laughs> More of a participant. Yeah. I did go play some college ball, but oh, I, there you I, go. Being, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's right. yeah, overachiever. So listen, I, I I'm a uh, I'm a Division One uh, college athlete too. Can can you guess which sport? What would you guess? Uh, On the men's side, let's be clear about that. Don't come up with a field hockey thing. Gymnastics, wrestling, close. There you go. Close. Same thing. You got that. Yeah, got the body. There you go. And uh, so. In school, in elementary, and then middle school and high school, how uh, how are you doing academically? Did you do well? Very average, very average. Mm -hmm. I had a good had a dad that kept me focused, mm -hmm. and uh, but not a great student. No. Not a great student. Didn't know how to study. Yeah, I loved school. I loved high school. I guess that's why I'm still in it. Yeah, but uh, not not a great. Uh, you know, student overall. Right. And then, um, so you loved high school. How about middle school? How was it? Was you, was that, was that, was I that? remember, I remember athletics uh -huh. and I remember a history teacher. Who's and that? Her name was Miss Fortenberry. Uh -huh. how, how can you forget a name like that? Right. Is it, in, I don't remember. Th uh, she, this is in Cy Fair and Spring this Branch. This was, now this is Spring Branch. This is uh -huh. at Spring Oaks Junior High. So, yeah, I know that's cool. Yeah. And I was there sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Some things have changed. I don't know if you noticed about spring. A few things that changed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, Miss Fortenberry. Uh huh. Tell me what you remember about her. I don't. If she's listening, uh -huh. she, she, I don't remember a thing she taught me, but I do remember how she made me feel. And I could not wait to get to her class yeah. every day and raise my hand and answer questions and participate. I was different in her class than I was in any. Other class. That's all I remember. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And I think um, sometimes we really underestimate that that power of I, I call it the power of the of just crossing the threshold of the door. Mm. Like you know, we, we talk about in teaching a rock star. I'm not sure if you remember, but one of the things we talk about is, you know, our goal is when the kid gets to be an adult, they have this this value system we hope within them that they're going to take around with them wherever they go. But when they're kids, they're they're, they're supposed they're, they're kids for a reason. And what happens is they, they step into a value system a lot of times wherever they are. And so that's why, you know, kids act very different, you know, sitting in the pews of the Presbyterian church right. than they do sitting on the back row of health. And so, so what, what you're saying is you are a different kid in her class because mm. of that culture that she mm. created. I was very, I was very quiet. And if, if, if we, if we ever had a parent conference with, with teachers, um, I'm sure most of my other teachers, when Ms. Fortenberry spoke up, probably looked and said, are we talking about the same kid? Because I, I, I didn't say, I just was not uh, very vocal, um, except when I came to her class. I, I, I think maybe because I just felt comfortable or yeah. safe in there. Yeah. I think that's what it is, man. Mm. Save, you know, you, you that nurturing, mm -hmm. you know, know, know that you're loved. Right. This is the safety and nothing bad is going to happen. Right. Yeah. That's amazing mm. that you still remember her. Right. You know, the, the, we were talking about the gentleman we have on the, uh, the podcast previous. Um, there was a moment um, with his, his name's Cameron. And there's a moment in that interview. I asked him about his junior high teachers. I said, who was important to you? And he stared down and he looked and it took about 10 seconds and he comes mm. up and he goes, I can't even name one. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Spent years with them. Can't mm. even name one. Mm. Just didn't have that you know, impact. The, you know what's, what's I've, I've thought about it before. The ones that you remember by name tend to be a lot of the elementary teachers. Because, yeah. of course, you spent most of the time All, with just one right. teacher. 
Miss Randall, you know, Miss Bradshaw, those are my first or second grade teachers, you know. And I, as you get older, I think they become, I think because you have more, but then you also have so much, the focus is not so much, there's so much other noise going on. Right. I think as you go through that, your academic career, that um, maybe the teacher's not quite the focus of right. your attendance elementary school i mean even 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 going to the potty oh <laughs> you know oh. lining up you oh, know yeah. oh yeah yeah i remember my daughter once i tucked her into bed one night and she said dad guess what we got to do today and i said what so he goes she goes we got to do a fire drill you know i'm thinking <laughs> i'm in high school and right. kids when we ring that bell like, oh my right. god <laughs> you know they're worried about their hair and how right. hot it is we got to go out. and this you know i said and of course it's on the 30th of the month that everybody they, knows it's ex- coming. oh exactly. we didn't do a fire yeah. oh it's, <laughs> it's raining yeah, yeah exactly we gotta go outside but here my daughter who you know who i tell her you know told her then i said could you just keep that joy somehow yeah you know that even a fire drill is an adventure right you know and uh but as I got older, the 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 teachers that stood out um, were my coaches, the ones that are. I mean, I can name them all, all my coaches. You know, good yeah. and bad, but mostly good that um, that were became my mentors. You know, and sure. probably one of the reasons why you know I became a coach too. So yeah, you know, I, I think you know you know, you know a lot of times if if you um, look back, whether it was Miss uh, Fortenberry in middle school or the coach on the it's it's it, it kind of all goes along with that emotion that we talk about because what you named in her class when well, I spoke up and I participated I felt safe that's an emotion you know she cared I felt loved you know all those things well on the football field it's it, that's an emotional thing too mm-hmm. you know when, when, and those guys are out there talking about strength and courage and mm-hmm. integrity and honor and all those and, you know and it's all emotionally based right. I think that's why kids remember those uh those, those people that influence their lives the most well there's nothing like a locker room yeah you, know, you just you don't people that have not experienced a locker room i mean if you could create that locker room in or on the field experience in the classroom you know that same type of camaraderie that sure. feeling of and brotherhood and you know and just uh, teamwork you know i think that would be the ultimate goal and i think that's what we try i think that's what the most successful teachers are yeah you know be able to recreate they're able to create that a relationship in a classroom. Mm. So, man, that's a good point. I've never really thought. You know, for me, I started as a band director. It's the same. You know, mm-hmm. the t- t- same thing. C- it, it is your coach, especially your- in Texas. The whole competition. Mm. You know, and it's it is a coach, and mm. and and the time involved, and their sectionals, and private lessons, and fundraising, and parents, and boosters, and uniforms. It's the same thing. And then as I moved from there into the classroom, I took all that with, me. and always, and I, as a band director, I would look at the classrooms. I think. You know, in the band hall, I don't care what's going on, how crazy it is. If I step on that podium, it shuts down mm-hmm. and it is quiet just because that's what we, we rehearse. We, we teach them to do that. And I always thought, to, how come when the math teacher stands up, everybody doesn't be cool? It just doesn't make sense to me as a mm-hmm. band director because that's what you learn, mm-hmm. you know, starting from when you're going to TMEA, when you're, mm-hmm. you know, in college and, and, and TBA and all those things. And, um, and so as I took, as I left um, the band world and stepped in, I taught, um, uh, science first, uh, biology. Um, you know, I, t- I took all those things with mm-hmm. me, and so we, 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 you know, we did the same things. We ran it just like the band hall. Mm-hmm. So we have you know microscopes and things, <laughs> right? You know, well, you know, in coaching, you take that lab to the field, right? And I think what happens is in cl- in the classrooms, sometimes we don't we don't take it from the lab, or we don't or we don't move from classroom phase to the lab or the to the activity or the hands on or the give and take. It's just all dissemination a lot of times. And so there's not that transference, you know, of not you know, it's not the give and take. It's not the uh, variety. It's not the creating that atmosphere. It's not the you know, it's you know, a football coach is not going to be very successful if all they do is stay in the locker room. Right. <laughs> I mean they have to go out eventually they got to take it out in the field and practice. Yeah. You know, and I think if, you know, I think of some of the greatest coaches I had, if, you know, if teachers followed that same mold of, you know, making them do it over again when they don't get it right, right. get back in line, let's do it again, you know, uh, you can do this thing, you know, all, right. using the same techniques, the same thing, and bring it into the classroom. So I think that's why I'm, you know, I'm not a great, uh, you know, my strengths are encouragement, 
And I, as a role as a principal, I think the number one thing that I do is I, I'm, the, I'm the campus cheerleader. Mm. You know, I'm encouraging teachers to be successful, encouraging students to be successful, exhorting them to do their very best, those kind of, that kind of thing. And, and I think that's the coach aspect. And I think that's the piece sometimes we miss in a classroom is we just we expect the kids to come in, sit down, get it, you know, without any type of – and that's not going to happen today. No. Because they're not getting it anywhere else. No. Nowhere else. I'm convinced of it. Yeah. And, you know, man, and like, like I talk about, I, I, I know this is wrong. And, like, us sitting here talking about it, I know, like, rationally I'm wrong. But when I'm in the trenches in the classroom, I convince myself 100% of these kids, this is the only place they're going to get it. I, I know some of them are going to have a great family mm-hmm. and some are going to have, a, you know, the mm-hmm. youth group and some have right. a coach, but, right. but that doesn't matter because it, because it, what, what I always say is that they'll forever be a better actor mm-hmm. than you are a teacher and you don't know who's who. Mm-hmm. So I convince myself I'm the only one they have every single one that way. That's yeah. That is a great way to look at it. I mean, I, I think that we don't, we cannot underestimate our, the value in yeah. their lives. You know, we're a lot, several years ago, we talked about teachers being lifesavers. We, you know, without being over dramatic, we really are. We are, we are throwing kids a life jacket every day, and probably some more than we even have can even fathom yeah. that we're the lifesaver. We're their lifeguard. We are, I mean, you know, you can use all kinds of yeah. par- parallels, but, um, and it's a little things, man. You know, you know, as I travel around, I hear these stories and, um, the one that comes to mind is there's a teacher talking to me and she was very unsuccessful. And, um, she said that there was, when she would get a lunch in, in fifth grade elementary school, she, she, she go down the line and the lunch lady, there's a woman there would stand at the and shoot and she would do the French fries and she would hand the French fries and then she'd give her a wink and give her a couple more. And she said, every day, that was like the thing. I would look for and I would wait for mm. that wink. Mm. And I would get in line and I would look down and she make sure she was there. And she was there every day. And, you know, you would think, just, just a wink and some extra fries. Mm-hmm. But for her, like that, it's like, that's what got her to school. Mm-hmm. And that's where she was loved, at the lunch line. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and, I, and, 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 and we have, and, 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 you know, as educators, as we come, you know, standing, greeting kids at the door, you know, the most important moment of the process and greeting you, you, mm-hmm. you greeting your kids as they're coming into the building. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a great opportunity to make that connection, you know, that sets up for the learning. Well, some teachers, I've had a teacher come to me and say, Jeff, how do we, how do we deal with kids that are bringing that baggage? You know, we can't change it, but what we can do in the few hours that we have them every day is show them a different, a different way. So maybe one day they, they take that, which is probably even more important than any reading, math, you know, whatever that we're uh, we're teaching that day is that life skill that that can cha- break the cycle. Yeah. That they don't continue the same thing, and they're you know they have a choice to really act. We show them a different way to act. A diff- that there is a different way. That's not that's that's not normal. What is normal is uh, you know compassion, you know, and gratitude. And acknowledgement, you know, and those kind of things. So yeah. somewhere, somewhere, maybe they take that with them, and when they, when they grow up and they have that reflection on their high school years, you know, they remember Miss Fortenberry, or they remember somebody that said, you know, that's how I'm, I need to treat my wife, or yeah. my children, or my coworker, everyone. Yeah, yeah. And so when when you were in high school and you had these influential uh, coaches, men in your life. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's some. It, it was it what was it then? You first thought, you know what? Maybe I could do this. Maybe I could be a teacher. Maybe I could be a coach. Mm. Well, you know, I went to school, and I was initially a social work major, mm-hmm. which is essentially what we do. Right. And it's the same. <laughs> yeah. And and after taking some courses that I probably wasn't supposed to be taking in upper level classes, I found out that that was not social work per se was not for me, and I did love my high school experience, my, my own personal school experience. Um, the mentors that you mentioned, um, my uncle was a coach, probably the most influential person in my life besides my father who, uh, and he was a coach. And, um, so I thought, well, that, that, that may be the route, you know? And so what I found out is I really got into teaching initially, truthfully, because to coach, Mm -hmm. then I found out, that the teaching was the icing on the cake. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, truthfully, even as a coach, I got 
somewhat tired of sometimes of my own athletes. I mean, it was the kids in the classroom that fed me, yeah. you know, that I could, you know, that I just couldn't, couldn't wait to get to, to have that type of relationship inside the classroom with them. Yeah. So it became, it was, um, you know, there was a, a lot of different reasons how I ended up there. I think I'm the, obviously, I think that's where I wouldn't have ended up regardless, but I didn't initially set out that way. Yeah. I think, I think it's true for, for a lot of teachers, you know, you know, like the content or for me, it was, you know, the, the music or mm-hmm. the, the sports or the coaching or that's what brings you in, mm-hmm. but what keeps you there, what right. keeps you coming back exactly. for the kids. It's like now, you know, I didn't grow. I don't think anybody, unless you have a, parent in your family that was a principal i don't think anybody says one day i want to grow up and be a principal i want to be that guy uh, yeah. so so i think that just ha- that just happens yeah, yeah maybe you know maybe becomes the longer you stay in education maybe that's the natural evolution but you know the door is open and things like that and and so forth but i mean i'm glad i think i have a you know i always tell people i have the second best job in the building i think i still think the best job in the building is the head football coach but this one has a little less pressure in, right. in Texas. Uh-huh. But I love uh, the sphere of influence that we have on kids as, a, as, as the principal of a high school. Yeah, yeah. So, so you thought that, so, so, you, so you went and you're doing a, a social work study, and then, um, and then you think, well, heck, co- 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 coaching really is that. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, kids, that sounds like fun. And I, I had a great experience. So you switch over and you major and you went and did your student teaching. Mm-hmm. How'd that go for you? It was good. Yeah. It was good. I did it in, in the Conroe ISD district i was a student teacher at the old mccullough high school yeah. which is now the woodlands mm-hmm. and uh, under weldon willig and had a couple opportunities to go to right out of high school there mm-hmm. and um but i wanted to come back home so yeah. i was blessed to be a, a junior high uh, teacher and coach at watkins junior high watkins and, start, Ju- and this is in 1982 the school was brand new uh-huh and uh so in the school, the way it kind of worked in Cypher at that time was that even though you coached, they really did not want you to start out brand new in high school. And, of course, I, you know, coming out of high school, college, I thought I knew all the answers. I, want, I didn't understand why I couldn't start off in high school, but it was a blessing because uh-huh. it gave me that perspective that you need as a high school administrator and coach to understand the needs or the challenges of the middle school, right? Because I was there. Yeah, I did it for three years. Now I don't know. I don't know if I could do it again. I go back and I think, how did I do this for three years? But you know, thank God there are teachers that love middle school kids, and uh, because that's tough. It is. It's tough. It's a tough world. It is. It's a whole different world. Yeah. I think, I think sometimes, well, I know for sure, um, because I've seen it that we really underestimate. You know, f- taking a kid from the eighth grade to the ninth grade. Mm. And that just a separate environment. I mean, it's it is. I mean, you can't even you can't even wrap your head around the mm-hmm. difference, you know. And so I always, you know, I, I know a few schools have taken up me you on know, my recommendation. But I always believe, especially in English, it, may, it always makes sense. Where I'm um, do that, we you know, I've kind of sponsored an exchange program. We've taken those high school ninth grade English teachers and let them teach eighth grade for a few days, and took those eighth grade and they show up at the mm-hmm. high school and they teach the ninth grade, and, mm-hmm. and that way they can mm-hmm. see. Is you know what really goes on yeah. on the different campuses, and these kids are just months away. Yeah, and um, it's always been a great thing. So, so, so you're there at Watkins, and how many years were you at Watkins? Three years. Yeah, loved it. Loved it. I was just like they, you know, I wasn't. I was young. Yeah, right out of, right out of college, so I was, you know, playing. I was just like a kid, big kid. Yeah, teaching all day, okay. coaching all night, mm-hmm. yeah. staying up late, mm-hmm. coming up with ideas for the next day, right. getting ready, getting up right. early. Right. <laughs> yeah. I remember it. Yeah, I know it. And uh, and so at some point you had an opportunity to move to the high school. Went to the high school. Langham Creek opened up in '85, mm-hmm. and so we fed Watkins fed Langham Creek. And so uh, went over to the high school. Was at Langham Creek High School with George Hopper for eight years. Yeah. And I, matter of fact, at that point in time, I thought that I would be at Langham Creek the rest of my career. You know, I just thought, you know I was a Lobo and I was a teaching and coaching there and. I had I had a unique situation because I started at Watkins and then moved to the high school. I had a group of three classes that went through there that I had from junior high up, right? And which doesn't happen very much in, often in a career, yeah. Where you have a, unless you just repeat the cycle, you know, go back down and come back up with them. And so I actually grew up with some of those kids. I mean, some of those kids now, you know, I'm 54. Some of those kids are 42, 43 years old. Those are my oldest kids. 
you know, some of them have kids as old as mine right. now, but, um, it's, it, those kids, I actually kind of grew up with them and, uh, still till this day, you have the relationships with a lot of those kids. And, um, it just really, uh, was a neat experience and a great time in my life, but I wanted to become a head football coach. I, had, I just had to be a head football coach. You know, I had that and just had, so I, I left the district for a year, uh-huh. went to Hempstead and uh, I was the head football coach at Hempstead, which is a little 3A school. Right. And so all of a sudden, I went from being a position coach where I didn't have to do, really do anything but show up and coach uh-huh. to, to painting the lines and mowing the yard yeah. and the grass and, and driving the bus, thinking, is this really? Is this <laughs> really? Really? I wanted to be head coach. Along with the pressure. Yeah. It, Especially in those yeah, towns. Yeah. Because those, those men yeah. will sit at the corner store yeah. and drink coffee and talk about you. Oh, and- yeah. Yeah, get so the school that, board to try to vote you out. And, yeah, well, so I was, and get this, I was the assistant principal as well, the assistant principal. So there's only 320 kids in the school, 9 through 12. So right. I'm, the, I'm the assistant principal and the head football coach. So in the daytime, I'm disciplining my athletes that I'm coaching right. in the afternoon. Right. So it was not a great combination. Right. It was not a good set scenario. A little cl- we lived in Hempstead for 10 years. It was a great situation. Lo- lived in an old Victorian home that was over 100 years old. My uh-huh. kids went from kindergarten to sixth grade, and kindergarten to eighth grade before we moved to Magnolia. I wouldn't have traded that experience for the world. Right. But I only worked in that district for one year, and I came. I got out of coaching quickly. But still lived out there. Still lived out there. Came back to Cy Fair mm-hmm. was, and went to Cy Falls High School with George Hopper again. Yeah. Was an a assistant principal there for, for three years and then moved to the Jersey Village. All right, so let me ask you this. When you were the assistant principal in Hempstead doing the discipline, mm. is this back in the day? Mm. You take, did they have the big the board? The board, oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. We had the board at Watkins. Really? Yeah, in 82. And Man, so, you know, but people it, around the nation, they have no idea what we're talking about. No, but, you know, that's that changed greatly. In Cy Fair, yeah. my, um, my first couple years of teaching, 82 to 84, 85, right. you could do the board, but you were really on your own. You know, I mean, the district kind of changed its uh, right. the whole perspective on that. And so we're not we're, backing you up in court on this one. Yeah, you're, you're, you're on your <laughs> You own, better right? be accurate. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah better be, hit the target. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but so I had, it, it's been literally since then, this will be my 32nd year and uh-huh. I haven't swung the board since, since 82, 83. Yeah. And I don't, and I, and I don't necessarily, you know, I, we can get in a whole discussion on that. But, right. But, uh, that's not happening anymore. No, no. That's, that's, that's in the rearview mirror. <laughs> not that interesting though. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm mean, like that. That's what it was. And I, but they still do it in these small towns. You know, there is. Yeah, they, you can sign even in in some districts. You can the parents can sign off. Right. You know, they have a little form to protect the school district. Right. Yes, I. You know, you can. Well, in fact, there's some school districts they have to sign off to not do it. So like they, they don't even know it's about to happen. <laughs> They assume the right to do it. You have to sign off so they won't do it. Yeah, yeah, it's still going on in Texas, mm-hmm. man. It's so interesting. Last frontier. Yeah, it is. And uh, and uh, so you you come back. You 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 did your years as head coach. You come back and you're the assistant principal again under George Hopper. And um, and how's it going for you? You think you think you, th- you think you're on your right track as far as what you're meant to do and making a difference? I think so. I think I initially come Friday night, I felt like a fish out of water a little bit. Like, yeah. okay, am I? Sub- I'm in the, I'm watching instead of really actively, but uh, but it was the right time and it was in the right time for a lot of things. It was the right time because my kids were at the age where. They needed their dad, and in coaching, quite frankly, you know, it starts in July, and you don't see them until December. And the only time I used to see my kids, and they were—they don't even remember me coaching. That's how young they were. Right. But they were getting to the age that they would have remembered. And sometimes I wish that they would have been a little bit older to know at least the last couple of years that their dad coached, because that's really what I am still as a coach. You know, as coaching people, and my teams have just changed now. But my passion for coaching and love for coaching people, but. Um, the only time I got to see them was when they were sleeping. Yeah. And we would we would play a game in the old Pridgen Stadium, and they would come down out of the bleachers, and we'd go up the hill right there by the field house, and mm-hmm. I'd just kiss them, my wife and my kids. And, you know, you know, I had two that were 15 months apart, so Kay would have – my wife would have my son in one arm and my daughter, you know, holding hands, and I'd kiss them and say goodnight. We'd go back to the field house and start watching film. Yep. And then, you know, all day Saturday and, you know, Sunday after church – 
you know, waiting for other, you know, somebody else to tell me I could go home. You know, it just, you know, that, that was the part that I did not miss. Yeah. We, and, but coaching was a great training ground for being an administrator because the hours. And the only difference is, as an administrator, you have a little bit more control over when you do those hours. I mean, you still got to put the hours in. You have night duties and things like that. But when the night duty's over, you get to get in the car and go home. Right. You know, you don't have to go back to the locker room and, you know, and pick up the tape off the floor and get ready for, you know, things like that. All, you know, those kind of things. Uh, I miss Friday night. I didn't necessarily miss the 95 degree humidity. And, right. Two days and all that. But, uh, anyway. you know, I think, I think, you know, when people really, um, are, there's some States like us in terms of coaching and the pressure involved with winning and football, and all that, but there's, but there's not a lot. Mm-hmm. And so, and so when I mention the coaching thing, we talk about it or, you know, you know, when I'm out of school in another state and you ask who the coaches are and you're like, there's two guys that mm-hmm. coach football at the high school, there's right. two of them. Right. And I think, you know, people really don't know what goes on and the pressure and the amount of uh, time um, here in Texas. I mean, this is, you know, this is a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't just, you know, it's not, a, it seems on the outside looking in, it seems like, why do they put so much time into this game? It's just a game. Well, you know, I'm earning a part of my salary. It's, they're paying me to do this. Plus, there are people that <laughs> they expect us to do something on Friday night, yeah, you know, and that's, you know, and that's to win. You know, the great thing about a Friday night in Texas, the peripheral things that it's what makes Friday night different in Texas is not just the emphasis on what's happening on the field. Right. It's the band. It's the drill team. It's the cheerleaders. Yeah. It's the whole the kids and, in the snack and, bar. Oh my gosh. The pep squad. It is, you know, and, spirit. yeah, you think about, you think about all the, you know, the people that are involved on a Friday night yeah, and those kids are there instead of being somewhere else. Right. And they'll remember it forever. It, exactly. And forever. It, yeah. And it's, there is nothing, it's just different. And it's even my wife who came from Colorado, she didn't get it right until she became a coach's wife. And then she gets it and her family doesn't get it. no, but you can't, you just can't explain no. it. You just cannot, you can't explain it. Right. I mean, even drill team right. in Texas is, is not like that. And it's a, it's you know not to demean a pep squad, but in other states it's just not it's just not the same. No, we take it to a whole it's a whole different level. It's yeah, a produ- it's a production. But to be a part of all of that, and to be part of that administrative administration of programs and seeing the value of all those extracurricular programs has given me a great perspective and um, as as a principal, you know, wanting sure. to have the best and be the best in everything. And provide programs for every all those kids' experiences. You know that's that's the total package, the whole the total ex- high school experience. You know that's what we want every. You know I want every kid that comes to the Magnolia High School, even if they don't participate in any of those programs, to be so proud that they go to that school yeah. because of the programs, the quality of programs that we have. You know, even if they don't even know, you know they've ever, they've never participated in those things. You know they they go to that school. Yeah, you know, they're fil- just their they're connected to their fil- affiliation with that. Sure, the only thing that they're proud of in their whole life. It might be. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, and, and so let's 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 figure out how, how how did you get there? So you went. So you're in Sci Fair. You're uh, you're you're doing the assistant principal thing for a while, and then you became the associate principal. Where was that? At Jersey Village. At Jersey Village. Okay, so Alan and Sarah left. You moved into Sarah's. Yeah, Dan, uh, Dan thrown. they hired Dan Troxel. Right. Great and, guy. Uh, uh, tell I, I said, Fredericksburg? Dem- is that where? I've spoken to his one district. Of, is yeah. it Fredericksburg? Um, Kerrville. Kerrville. I spoke up there. He's yeah, I met him. You know, several years ago, a couple mm-hmm. years ago, superintendent of the year in yeah. State of Texas. Yeah. Um, he walks through that door right now. You think he's an IBMer? Uh-huh. I mean, he's just. Right. A, a, I mean, he was a. Um, I mean, I think he was a principal at age 32. Something like at that. At Allen ISD. Right. And then he came to Jersey Village, and it, what's crazy is he. I still didn't know whether I wanted to go. The, I still had the coaching in me. Uh-huh. So when I met him, the first time I met him, I interviewed for the head football coaching job I, after I'd been out of it. Well, he also had heard in the district that I was apparently to some of the leadership in in IS, in Cypher ISD that I was an up and coming administrator. Right. So he didn't hire me obviously as the head football coach, but he said, Are you interested in interviewing for the associate principal's position? 
And so, you know, I tell my kids all the time that sometimes when you interview for a job, it's not necessarily for that job, right. maybe for another one in the future or something else that comes. So, you, you know, re, so be prepared. So then, anyway, that's how that happened. Looking back, was that the best thing that could have happened? Oh, the best thing that could have happened was that I got out of coaching in Hempstead, that I went to Hempstead, <laughs> and, that was a, and that ended up being a bad situation because uh, if I hadn't, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Right. Uh, I, you know, I don't know where I would have been. I th- see, at that point in time, li- living, my dream was I was living in the town that I was coaching, and I thought that would be, that I would retire of maybe at, from that to the AD or something like that, and that's right. all I would do, never get out of coaching, coach football the rest of my career and so forth. But from a very bad situation came a very good thing. Yeah. And you don't see it at the time. You know, I had no season. I felt like I really had no season of redemption. We weren't very successful. You know, one year. I mean, usually it takes three to five years to build at a least. program. Yeah. You know, and uh, but anyway, moved on, water under the bridge, it, you know, moving forward, doors opening, different directions, um, learned from that, you know, it gave me a different, definitely a perspective, you know, from from that point of view. And uh, and had an opportunity to go to work for Dan and was his associate for four years, and then he moved on. Yeah, moved, so he was over out. there, and the, and so the talk was the, always the talk was you were going to become the principal, and he was going to become the superintendent. Mm-hmm. That's kind of you know he was going to go to the central office at some point, and so but what had happened was he ended up. What did he do? Did he, he go to central office first? He was kind of like a lobbyist for the district. You yeah, know, he was kind of. He he was in Austin a lot. Uh huh. It was a, I think some kind of kind of a pseudo associate or assistant superintendent at some level, you know. Right. And um, he obviously had his doctorate, you know, very well thought of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they brought Ralph Funk in, who's became a gr- another great mentor of mine. A- again, another situation where, uh, w- where in my mind at the time, d- great disappointment became uh, a, a real plus in the long run because it, I gained another mentor. Right. But I, I, as you know, not the, did not become the principal at Jersey Village High right. School, and really kind of, I really got disillusioned a little bit. I really thought, okay, they're creating, they're putting me uh, in an associate role, but it, but the communication to me was that 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 was not the direct um, route to the high school principalship. It was a more of a direct route back to the junior high to be a principal there. And I did, I really, after spending in so many years at the high school level. At that point, I didn't see myself back at, at junior high, yeah. and so uh, eventually I succumbed and I interviewed several times in the district and just didn't, just you know for whatever reason it just didn't happen. Yeah. As a matter of fact, thought I was even going to maybe step back. I was in I was doing this ministry thing on the side, mm-hmm. and and I thought, well, maybe I'll maybe I'll even become an assistant principal and I and have my summers because as an associate you spend as almost as much time as the principal doing the master schedule in yep. the summer. So I thought that would give me time for ministry and I could kind of like the teachers when the last day I could walk out and then come back in, have six weeks off and not have as much rep- responsibility. This thing's not going to happen. It wasn't that I was taking my toys and going home or anything like that. I just thought, okay, maybe that's not what God wanted me to do. Sure. So I went to Ralph and I said, Ralph, would you, it, would you hire me as an assistant if I stepped down as your associate? And so we literally did the the revolving chair thing in front of a faculty meeting in, in May. I we had two we switched places. I switched with Cheryl Johns. Uh huh. Right. And she became the associate, and I was going to be the assistant. And and then guess what happened? I get a phone call from Magnolia ISD and says, "Are Jeff? Are you still interested in becoming a high school principal?" And I said, "Yes." And so, you know, the rest how did that happen? How, I mean, how do they know about you? Well, I think I had applied before, uh-huh. and um, the, the, the superintendent now, Dr. Stevens, was somebody that I actually went to school with at Abilene Christian when I played football. Mm-hmm. And we had kept, maintained a relationship over the years, saw each other at coaching school maybe once a year or once every other year. Didn't, then there was a period of time that I didn't see him for several years because he got out of coaching too, and he was, and he was in, obviously in the administrative mold around yeah. and he called me one day and said so uh, a year a year prior to this phone call and said a friend of mine is probably going to get that job uh, what do you know about magnolia isd and i didn't know much about a magnolia isd at that time and uh, he says well i think he's going to take the job and i'm going to come with him and of course then 
during that year that they took that job off and on we kind of you know he knew my experience coming from big district not no principal's experience but but trained well in a big district and so forth and yeah. and so they invited me a year later to come for a panel interview and you know and so it was a panel interview for about nine people teachers community members things like that still had to you know had to you know they they i had to get the thumbs up you know for, right you know and so i think i was so i was a finalist and then uh you know the rest is history so i became yeah. the principal there and and so what I thought was the end of a of of a path, became, a door opened, a wide open, and um, so then I stepped through, and we we moved to Magnolia, Texas. It was the greatest thing that ever happened for my family because it's a great place to live. Oh yeah. And uh, my fr- my daughter was a freshman when I was a freshman at as the principal, and um, we sp- spent four years uh, together, and my son went through. Uh, my school as well and graduate two years later. And so I've been able to hand both of those kids their diploma, you know, and who gets, who is a dad gets. Right. That's hand. amazing. So anyway, I'm just completely blessed. So I always talk about, you know, you know, I talk about humility and so forth. And sometimes you have to humble yourself and then he'll raise you up. And I think that's what I did. I, I, I said, look, you know, if you, Lord, if this is not going to happen, you know, I got this hunger to be this principal and I kept running into the wall and doing it my way. And, it just wasn't supposed to be at Jersey Village High School. Yeah. So for for a short period of time, I had a hard time with that because I loved, I, I loved wherever I go. You know, I mean, I become part of that, and you know, I, and it, so it was disappointing that I wasn't going to be the principal at, at Jersey Village High School. But then you buck up and you learn from the new person, Ralph right. Funk, who's one of my good friends now, and became another mentor for me. Great principal. He is. Yeah. He's, doing, he's doing great things, and he does. And he was the right man for the job. Yeah. Looking back. Looking back. And now he's been there one more year than I have here. Right. So so I, I worked for him for one year. Got a, I got enough, just enough. Um, and, uh, you know, toward, toward the tail end, I was lucky to be there at the beginning of his, his career at Church Village, and, and we've kept in touch ever since. So moving into Magnolia High School, and um, it was a new building, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and you're the new guy. You know, moving into that school, did you did you um, make some immediate changes at first, or what, what was your what was your what was your first goal well, moving we, in there? The, I just had this conversation the other day. Magnolia is, and we have 101 years of tradition behind us, but the building, like you said, was brand new. Yeah. So it was like moving into a a, a model home and nobody and it, undecorated. Right. So I everything we see. So I so I can talk about Magnolia High School in 101 years a tradition, but inside that particular building, there had been nothing, no banners, no trophy cases, nothing, nothing visible. So when, right. so I can say nobody that, showing up for homecoming right, 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 from right, that school. Right. So when I walk into that building now, you can everything you everything you see. It was now it was open one year before I got there. Right. So, so okay. So um, this is my 12th. So the building's 13th. And um, but fortunately. I still, you know, the the handprints are all over the place. What we've been able to do, and which is not always the case in a career of an administrator, because a lot typically you follow somebody or go somewhere right. where it's already they've already been there, done that, and it would take years to put because you don't want to change that. Uh, it, it would have been the same way if I hadn't been the principal at the old high school building, right? You know? So, so anyway. Um, the f- very first thing, the very first month, we we put banners in the front hallway that you saw that talks about the characteristics, the universal mm-hmm. principles. Uh, Let's that- talk about those because I think those are key. And you know when when I, when, when I talk about uh, going into schools and I've been, and I've been in hundreds and I talk about the Magnolia High School everywhere I go because. Um, you know, you know, quite honestly, uh, every school, what I call, has this vibe to it. And this is what I put in, 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 that, in that letter to you. And, and is um, every school has this feel where you're walking through the front doors and you, and you can just feel it. And I'm talking, you know, kids are in classrooms. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of movement out there um, in the front office. But, you know, just walking to the school. But you can just feel what, what that school really is all about. And I think as educators, we kind of learn that over the years. And what, 
and when I first came to Magnolia, well, the first thing I noticed was, you know what? Some kid walked up and greeted me at the door. <laughs> Some kid just went up with a pile of books in one arm and a backpack says, "Hey, how's it going? Welcome yeah, to Magnolia cool. High School." And that's I, cool. well, nice to meet you. Can you show? And it was, and, and then you start looking around, and there's the banners mm. of um, there's integrity and and, and honor, and, and and but what I always try to tell people, this isn't something that you can fake. You just can't hang a bunch of banners. Mm. This is something that is really happening in those, and something that they talk about and live mm-hmm. from the top all the way through, mm. you know, from the principal's office, through the counselors, through the teachers, the kids, everybody. And so, so was that something that you thought in your mind that we're going to create? This is something yeah. that we're going to build in this school. Yeah, yeah, immediately. Because what, was gonna, what we want is what you're talking about. We want, regardless of whether it's a, a community member or a, a brand new family that's that's checking out schools because maybe they're moving to this area, or somebody just stopped in, in for directions. We want them to feel like this that there is something different. I mean, there are high schools all over the United States of America. You know, we want to be different. What's going to set us apart? And the difference is that we want to create an environment where that we're principal centered, that everybody that walks through the door becomes one. And that is our that's a vision statement, and right. that's non negotiable. Now, how we achieve that? Through the mission of the, you know, and our goals is is where I get where we get the input, you know, and we get that through, you know. And I asked a teacher several years ago, what were the three things, you know, and we talk about excellence, respect, and family. Those are the three. Those are the three. Now, how are we going to, you know, under each one of those, how are we going to develop? What's respect look like? What's family look like? What's excellence look like? Those undergird that principal sh- uh, uh, leadership uh, centered environment that right. we want to create and so um which again it could be a bunch of words but it you can't it, you can't get there overnight and, and believe me i had some pushback for about two years because one of the things we if you the other thing that i did immediately was put our put a family logo it took the m and we put the word family around it with a bulldog in the back which right. is our mascot and almost every floor mat every door every entrance everything cards logos everything and of course pushback on that was hey we were a family before you got here jeff you know so you got you know so you kind of have to be you know you got to be aware of that because yeah. people you know hey you're you just joined this family that right. kind of thing you're, you know, you're trying <laughs> to tell us we got to be a family and all right. that stuff. and that's not and so really my conversation there was just the emphasis of family not saying we weren't a family but t- we just want people to know but we got to act like a family you yeah. know sometimes families are dysfunctional but we but we worked through those things and so it was tough for first couple of years because first couple of years we didn't have another high school in our district we were the focus and when you are the focus in a district like us even though we're a 5A school at that point uh-huh. Uh, enrollment wise, we still are a community with one high school in in the most in, in probably the focal point of the community. So that everything flagship. If yeah. something happened during the day, if there was maybe one fight uh. or some scenario, it, it was much always much bigger than it really was sure. by the time it got home. You know, and and so we kind of you just people are not going to love you just because you walk through the door. You have to earn it, and it takes time. And so it took about it took a good three, four, five years to kind of get the boat turned. Then they realized I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> he, he ain't going. I mean, I'm not going because I always talk about the ten year plan, right. three or five, and that really gets some of those. They either like they start scratching their heads. Hey, I'm not going. This guy's going to, you know, he's not going anywhere. So either I get going or I get on. Right. You know, one of those two things, and. And slowly but surely, those people would peel themselves away uh-huh. or they would get on board. And then, so essentially, I've hired, I would say, 90% of the staff that are there after 11 years. And um, so you just kind of continue to build that trust and, and, and um, be who, really be who you say you are, you know, and that just takes time. You know, I think one thing that... Um it's interesting is when I, when I see that banner, you know, a place that is principal centered, you know, for all that to work, it has to be both principal centered and principal centered. You know, the, these are principles, but also the principal has to be living by those principles. So right. it's an interesting way it's phrased because it could work either way. Right. Because if, if you're not really living your life congruently with what we're saying we're doing in this and the story that you're telling, 
and all the in this family that we want to be, then none of it's going to work. Right. Because they'll know. Just right. like the kids in the classroom know when a teacher f- th- didn't know. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, they, they might be saying that, but that, but I can tell by yeah, the way. Yeah, you can't kid a kid. No. That's what say, you know. Yeah, they know. And the hard thing, you know, the hardest thing about the family, when you stand for something, then people are going to use that against you. A lot of times. Right? Oh, yeah. You know, the fir- very first conversation I might have with a, a parent about a teacher or something like that. Well, I thought, you know, I thought you guys were a family. You know, that kind of stuff. Well, you know, again, we're going to work through that. That's That gives us the, con- at least it gives us a conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, we can work through it. Sometimes, again, not all families are, you know, functioning correctly all the time, 100% of the time. But we're still, because we are family, we're not going to just walk out the door. You know, we're going to stick together. We're going to work through this thing. We're going to get it right. And, um, you know, one of the things that we're, we're going to work on this year, and I don't, you probably maybe are going to get to that point, we are. is, is um, we, we're going to get back to the relationship part of it. You know, we've been talking about excellence to eminence. eminence. How do we, looking at those programs, looking at those things that we have that we do well, that, we're, that are excellent, but how do we move them to where we are known for that to become eminent, to really be the, you know, Magnolia High School. I told last year's senior class that they were the group that put the the in Magnolia High School. And, you know, because of what they've done and helped move us the last four years. And so how are we going to perpetuate that on an ongoing, regular basis? That becomes tradition. That's just the way we operate, you know. And so, but to, to, to really keep that going is I want to ask my teachers this year, how are they going to communicate to their students on a daily basis that every student is valuable, every student that walks through their door is complete? In other words, they have what it takes. We're just gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna maximize the potential that they bring in. You know, they're complete. They don't they need nothing else. They're good enough. Right. We're just gonna help them. We're gonna coach them, and then um, that they're loved. So that they're valuable that they're complete and they're loved. So how do we, how do we, how do we put that in, infuse that in lessons, lesson plans? Right. How do we communicate that in our, in the words that we use? You know, if you're not touchy feely or that or or nurturing, then you need to come up with a way to communicate that some other way, because that's, what's going to separate us from the high schools down the road, because we're all, I mean, at this point, I believe most public high schools have, the people academically. Yeah. Hopefully you get the right people in place. What's going to make the trans, what's the intangible is the next level. And that's to believe in every single kid that, and have the, that every kid believes that they are valued and that they are complete and they are loved because they're not going to make, they're not going to get that ever outside those doors. Guaranteed. So. And so, you know, for me, I think that for that, I think one of the uh, people that made a difference in my life was Barbara Crook at Side Springs. And what I learned from her is how you look them in the eye and just tell them. And, you know, and she, she would say how they don't know. Yes, you get your hair very early in the morning, but they, they don't know what that is. They don't know it's because you love them. Of course, you stay late, but they don't know it's because you love them. Of course, you think about them at home and you work really hard. Mm-hmm. You have to say those words. You have to tell them. Mm-hmm. And so that that's and when when I've started doing that, man, it changed everything for me and my teaching and my kids and what we were able to accomplish as a classroom and and so you know for for you the when when you were at Magnolia and first in those first few years there were I, I'm assuming some folks that just didn't fit into the program that um, their style of teaching and what their belief system possibly um, in terms of teaching just wasn't a good mm-hmm. match for what you were trying to do. Did, there, there were a lot of great things happening. Yeah. Before I got there. Yeah. And, but there, were, it was happening. But privately, right. <laughs> it was happening in the cl- in just their classroom. There was not much collaboration mm-hmm. within departments. There was, you know, when I talked about when I mentioned the word words team planning, and you would have thought that that was that I made that up. <laughs> and of course, I came from my paradigm. From Cypher ISD was so you know so much different fr- from and I had and I had to shift myself. It was a shifting you know coming to the middle, the Brit coming to mm-hmm. the center. For they their paradigm was first of all we were growing like at eight to ten percent. So overnight some of these teachers went from a three A four A to five A to twenty eight hundred kids overnight. 
which was what we thought was normal. Right. Sci fair. Right. 2,800 was not big. I mean, we had 3,200, 3,300 at, at uh, Jersey Village in the smallest building. Right. You know, small, you know, so to do a master schedule with 3,200 kids with the smallest lab space in the district before they did this, uh, you know, building and remodeling of mm -hmm. Jersey Village now. Um, so my paradigm was, wow, I've died and gone to heaven. Their, their paradigm was the sky is falling. Right. You know, all this big school, you know, when you become big school, you have big school problems. You know, I'm, I was used to that. They weren't used to that. Sure. And so when I would thank the kids and pl applaud the kids when we have some, you know, building-wide emergency, and, they, and I thought they'd handled it well, the teachers would say, why? You know, and they're thinking, why would he, you know, thank them for doing it? behaving well when i you know because in their paradigm it was a disaster yeah you know so we had to come there were that's just an example of where we had to come together come to groups but w when i was talking about team planning i didn't mean lockstep i didn't mean that everybody had to say the same words and teach it the exact same way i just thought hey wouldn't it be nice if you know your expertise and my expertise we got together and we talked about professional learning <laughs> like at lunch or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know common planning periods you know and all right. this kind of stuff. i mean i just kind of blew up their that their world that way mm -hmm. and um plus you know there's politics and everything yeah and when i first got there i was not the the choice of the people just like when i didn't get the job in jersey village and so yeah. i had to kind of fight that a little bit and so yeah. So I had, you know, just like anything else, you have some inner, you have your meetings, then they have their meetings and right. that, that kind of stuff. Did uh, did uh, some folks get along instead of getting on? Did they move on? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, here's what's so great. Now, I don't think I had, I didn't have to peel away anybody. They peeled themselves away. Yeah. It just wasn't for them. It just what they, it was a win-win, you know. And yeah. Sometimes it took a little bit longer sure. for some to get that, uh, you know, recognition, mm -hmm. but, and, and, but v with very little encouragement from me. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. You no, know, I used to talk I used, when I was younger and, uh, Cy Springs, uh, when I first moved there, it, I was the second year the school was open. We had, you know, two, two first, we had freshman, sophomore in the building and it's very different uh, from what it is today. And, and it was before, and now, you know, we got to like 4,800 kids mm -hmm. at one year, a whole different population. And when those kids, uh, teachers started to hate those kids, the new kids that came in, and and they, they couldn't teach them, and it just made me so mad. And then I couldn't stand those teachers. But then I finally realized, you know what? They they used to be a great teacher, mm -hmm. and they are a great teacher. They just had the wrong kids. These just aren't your kids. Yeah, go find your kids. You know, and they and they all left. Of course, they left. They went and found their kids. I'm sure they're doing great wherever they are now. And so what what you were doing there just wasn't a good fit for what they wanted to do and and so i'm sure they're doing great wherever they've mm -hmm. moved on to and right. you're doing great with your group and 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 the story is going to tell you about betsy lane uh high school this is a great school uh mount eastern mountains of kentucky um, amazing people you know the cool thing about me man i get to i get to f i find these little nooks of of the country that just amazing things are going on with what and doing the best they can with what they have and um and i've been out there a couple times now and i was talking to the principal and i think i want to say it was physics and um she had been teaching physics as the principal and um and for i mean it was about a semester and i said i said oh well i guess it's hard to get a physics teacher out here you know what she said she said oh no we've had lots of people interview we just mm. haven't found the right one. That's amazing. Yeah. I'll teach it. Mm, that's awesome. Just haven't found the right member of the family. Mm, mm -hmm. You know? So it's interesting that here you are, you know, doing your thing in, in this growing, almost getting close to the, this metropolitan area coming your way. Mm -hmm. And there they are in the mountains of, you know, Kentucky. It's the same thing, same yeah. philosophy, yeah. same concepts, just on a different, in a, I mean, different, different, you know, geographically. Well, the, you know, the question that we have to ask ourselves when we interview an applicant or we have a, a loss of a teacher and we have to replace a teacher for whatever reason and now it seems in most cases now it's because they got an opportunity to to grow you know move up or or maybe they their husband got transferred or or, or whatever there's a re, there's a family decision mm -hmm. um it's not rarely is it because they're unhappy at this point but the question when we consider their replacement is are we better 
uh, you know, are we better? Where are we? Because we've got to constantly, or, you know, we cannot go backwards. Our kids are too valuable to bring in. And we've had a situation last year where we were lucky. We had a long-term sub, had a science opening. And fortunately, this lady who didn't want to, she didn't want to go back to teaching Mm -hmm. full-time, but she basically is in our building as much as some of our full-time because she's done a couple long-term stints with us. But we, we, want, we wanted to keep that job open until the right person came along. Fortunately, we could do that because we didn't have a principal who could teach physics, but we had, uh, I would, we'd be in big trouble if you wanted to put me in physics. <laughs> but, but we had a long-term sub who was sort of a teacher that's able to fill that role and didn't miss a beat and allow us to keep that full-time position open until another calendar year came around so we could find the right person. Yeah. And I think too many times, Schools are handcuffed. They just have to fill a box. They have to. They just have, you know, and then it, it's just, oh. I can remember, you know, when I first started at Cy Springs, and we did the, you know, first day of back-to-school in services, and there, uh, and Mr. Meek stood up, and he said, I don't know, who are the new people? And there were, like, maybe eight of us stood up, and he pointed it. All right, well, that's Sean Carr. He's mm-hmm. coming to us from Jersey Village. He's also a student there. That's Hal Bowman, and he's, you know, he, mm-hmm. he gave everybody's bio and named mm-hmm. everybody. And then a few years later, he had gone, and we had a new school, and, and Sarah Hardy, and um, I was sitting next to her in the opening day, and the line of new teachers went off the stage. They had a microphone they had to get up, and went off down the steps and along the sides, the same auditorium, basically, mm-hmm. that you have. Mm-hmm. And I want to say, there had about like 48, 50-something yeah. yeah. new teachers, and I said, I said, do you even remembering, do you, do you remember every one of those interviews? She goes, I really mm. can't say honestly that I remember even yeah. their names. And it was just, we, you got it, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's such a shortage at, at that point. Now it's mm-hmm. a different deal. And, uh, but I think the challenge is, is getting the right people, like you said, in the right spots, the strengths, you know, teaching their strengths in the right school at the right time with mm-hmm. the right leadership. And that's where amazing things happen. And, and like you have going on there. And I remember the conversation when I got to uh, uh, speak in uh, Magnolia was I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, we we're uh, behind the curtain. I was about to do my thing. And I said, hey, tell me, what are you excited about next school year? And then I was, you know, because I always ask, because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested. And I always hear the same things. You know what they talk about? They'll talk about, you know, um, well, we got a new computer lab, and we're really pumped about that. And they'll talk about it. <laughs> and then you said, you stopped, and you said, you know, I've been thinking about this concept for a while now. And it's this idea of moving from excellence to eminence and i went i'm not even sure what that means (laughs) i was waiting to hear about you know maybe they got a new electric scooter so you get down the hallway faster (laughs) eminence and then i had to stop and think and you were telling me about it and like i went home that night and had to google some things i'm like well what a heavy concept you know and i thought well what I guess that is the next step because, you know, you, you've, you, in Magnolia, at the, at the Magnolia High School, you've been able to accomplish so many things. Mm-hmm. And so that, so that is the question, like, what do we do next? Yeah. We've won this. We have a full trophy case. We have happy kids. We've, mm-hmm. we've been a YouTube sensation for the, the, the lip the thing. And so, so this concept of excellence to eminence, we'll talk about that for a second. Hey, what? Well, how we have accomplished a lot of things, but we got really, we got, you have to sustain that. And it's not just a, enough to do it once. You know, that's excellence, but eminence is to repeat excellence over and over and over again to the point it becomes just, that's just what you, that's just who you are, just what you do. And we're, we're not there yet because there's so many aspects, as you know, of a school day and school programs. And, uh, you know, it's not just about winning something or getting the trophy. It's, um, because, you know, sometimes what does that, what, I mean, really in the end, what does that really, that really mean? But things that are going to, um, just be part of kids' lives, you know, that I want, you know, the goal would be for me, which is, seems like utopia is that every kid would wake up in the morning and say, you know, I get to go to school, you know, I get to go to that place and we're nowhere near that, but we're trying to create trying to create that that doesn't mean and we may never achieve that but we but you've got to have that and that's part of that reinventing yourself you know asking teachers to reinvent yourself you know why did you know and renew yourself why did you become a teacher to begin with let's get back to what gave you that passion that joy um I think the beauty is now that I've been in this thing long enough that I can I can ask those questions of, of teachers now. I can have that expectation of teachers now that are with us 
Um, because if you can't do those three things I talked about before, value, complete, love, you can't express those things, then maybe, maybe you're not, in, well, why do you do this? Right. Then you, get, then you have that conversation. And so um, the other thing that I want to talk about is, you know, we talk about the greatest impact today. And, you know, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but GIT, okay, right. the greatest impact today. What is it today? What today can you, you know, instead of all the stuff that comes from us a lot of times as a teacher, you know, they feel like, oh, I don't even want to go to the mailbox right. or open my email. There's one more directive or one more thing that we have to do. And, and, and it all trickles down because the same thing happens to us from, from central office and so forth. But we, you know, in education, we, we don't, we continue to pile on but we don't take away anything, you know? So, so what I tell the teachers, I remind them part of my job is as far as my coaching is to remind them in the midst of all of that stuff, when it comes down to it, you need to figure out what is going to make the greatest impact today. Yes. So, uh, you know, I know you, we want you to check role correctly and that's very important that please take role. Don't, you know, I don't want to, minimize that but but in the big picture what is the great today so figure that out and so if we can get to the point where teachers can verbalize that on right. a daily basis you know have that conversation and identify it because i think that's what keeps you going yeah i gotta tell you you know i'm not after i successfully take role accurately i'm not looking to high five anybody <laughs> <laughs> but if i can talk about yeah whose life i changed today or that look in the kid's eye where i know he got it yeah today finally Mm -hmm. Or the kid finally shook my hand at the door instead of just, you know, mm -hmm. brushing by me, rolling right. his eyes. You know, I, I, you know, that's that's what that because that's what brings us back. Mm. You know, and that's what fires me up to teach even more intensely and more emotionally and more passionately the next, you know, in third period. Mm -hmm. You know, those are great conversations to have. And I think you know you're right, man. You know, I, I think the vast majority of teachers they they have they have they have all the strategies they need. They have all the techniques they're going to, you know, but I think what, what it, what it is, is, is getting back in touch with that. Why their purpose, the passion for this whole thing, mm -hmm. being excited about it and then being contagious and spreading that, mm -hmm. you know, and if, and if you're on fire today, make sure you get in the classroom across the hall, mm -hmm. spread that stuff around. Right. So right. critical. So let me ask you this, cause this, this is a, this is a debate I have with people in the business community. I say, I think people really underestimate the leadership qualities that's required to step into a principal job. And let, let's talk about specifically in Texas at a major high school, whether it's, you know, here in HISD or in Sci Fair or, you know, in Plano, or the you know, Magnolia High School. If you think about what's going on here, we have thousands of customers coming to you every day. We have hundreds of people on staff of all different uh, areas, whether, whether it's our grounds crew, our food services, we have a health clinic, we have daycare, we have, you know, we have all, uh, everything you know, on a high, high school. We're going to, they're going to transport. We have transportation. This is a city that we're going to run for hours and then send them back home. And, and I think in like in the business world, there would be years and years of specialized training leading up to this position. Of you know they they would be they would be plucked out of the MBA program after they finish at Rice, mm -hmm. and then they would be put in a position that's going to groom them for the next spot before they ever get even close to running an organization of thousands of people. But what's different in education? We've got some guy coaching on a football field, <laughs> teaching health over Langham. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then and then and then within years he's a, he's an associate. Oh, I'm gonna be assistant now, and then boom, he's a high school principal. Mm -hmm. I, and and to show up and be successful, I'm not sure that we we position our leaders in schools to be successful. I'm not sure that enough preparation is in place, mm. really. I always wonder about that. Do we really have enough program in place? So are we setting them up to be successful as we could be, or maybe as we should be, uh, p p providing enough uh, tools and strategies? But somehow, some people just excel. And I think for you, it had a lot to do with your mentorship along the way. It had a lot to do with coaching. It had to do a lot to do with your belief system, your ministry, your faith. A lot. There's a lot of ingredients. But for just a kid who's now 28, he's going to he's, he's his first assistant principal job is he's a, you know interviewing. I mean, how do you prepare? 
mm. to run a huge organization like that at some point yeah. is the question. And so, and so if, if you had any advice to that assistant principal right now, they're thinking, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm the guy or I'm the gal. I, mm-hmm. I, really, I really believe I'm a, I'm a building principal. I'm a head principal kind of person. What would you tell them as far as gaining the skill mm. and expertise necessary mm. to step into that role? Because it's monumental. I think yeah. you really underestimate. Yeah, yeah it's, it's one of those things where I remember being an assistant principal thinking, you know, I want to be an associate principal because an associate principal, the way it was set up in Cypher primarily, was not, didn't have direct discipline, was able to kind of come in and out. The, my perspective was the associate could kind of bebop in and then, you know, kind of, and then kind of give advice. Yeah. You know, and then kind of walk away. <laughs> I'm just bebopping yeah. around so campus. I, so I want to be the associate principal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the fun guy. And then you become the associate principal and you go, I want to be the principal. Yeah. Because, you know, all he does is delegate stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got to do the master schedule. Uh-huh. You know, all this kind of stuff. I never see kids. I, I you know, anyway, there's, you know, there's, it's nothing. It's never, no matter what preparation, it's never like that, um, the pro the education classes that you take, you know, that are no, textbook. Of course. It's there's nothing like life uh experience. My my blessing was that I, I really believe my advantage over some of the assistant principals, even in my own district, is that I had a larger scale picture um, given to me because of the, the the a large district that had the people unlimited people resources. Uh that I, and then because I had because of more schools and more opportunities, I got to work under more people. You know, bless their hearts. My associate, my assistant principals have been. They only know me. My uh, they're amazing, but they've only been with, with me for 10, 11 years, which can be an advantage or a disadvantage. But because at, by the time that I uh, obviously, there's a lot of stability in my administration. My associate principal's been with me for seven years. Now, she's a little bit older, and she's been at other schools. She she was that before she came here, whereas these uh, two, two or three of my assistant principals became assistant principals out of the teaching ranks while I was, I've been there. So my my in that case where you're limited, I would um, – Obviously, continue your education as much as if I was a little bit younger, I probably would have pursued my doctorate. Mm-hmm. Um, get in cohorts, cohorts when cohorts where you have professional conversations with other principals th- to see how they do things, right. and not, not just the one that you work for. Um, ma- get involved in your district as a at the curriculum level or the district level volunteering opportunities committees to broaden your your perspective you know not just being locked in as the is the fireman who puts out fires you know discipline or you know get your hands in a lot of different aspects you know the great thing you know the the positive of being in a small district is you get because of the uh, lack of of staff you you able you probably do a lot more uh, have a lot more responsibility job description wise in a, in a smaller school. Whereas in a, as an assistant principal in Cy Fair, the disadvantage was, is that, you know, this guy does this and this guy does that. A through and, E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't rotate keys and textbooks and, right. and all that kind of stuff through your career. I was only assistant principal for four years, but during that four years, I didn't experience the whole gamut. Mm-hmm. So I just, you know, I just, because I'm such a big picture guy, I just know what it looks like. I don't necessarily know how to do it. You know, whereas uh, nuts and you get, you probably get a lot more nuts and bolts in a smaller district. Um, but again, um, to me, the ex- broadening your opportunities by uh, getting yourself exposed to as many different responsibilities as possible uh, will get you more ready for when you sit in that chair. And um, although the day looks different from behind the chair, and maybe I don't have, there are days where um, I don't have the 
you know, eight to four nonstop discipline, et cetera, et cetera, parent phone calls. You know, it only takes, as the principal, it only takes that one phone call. And that's the difference in the job. And you don't understand the magnitude really until you sit in that chair. And I tell people this all the time. Sometimes, very rarely do I walk, when I get to school, do I walk through the front door of my school. I always usually walk through one of the side doors. And, and, I, and it, it's because if sometimes I, if I look up and I see the Magnolia High School and I go, and I'm the principal, I'm the principal? <laughs> But that's kind of sometimes that response that is, you know, overwhelming to think that. But you the the great thing about it is, is you don't you don't have time to really dwell on that part of it. You just do. Right. Just you just you just do it. How would I have been better prepared? I don't think because I was under six or seven key people. Sue Pope, George Hopper. These Mm. are who's who's in Cypher. Dan Troxell, Ralph Funk, Bo Favor, Tatika Leolio. All of these people over a career of 19 years in a side fair district was it where I learned something from every one of those people, um, you know, make was enabled me to become who I, who I am today. And what would George do? What would Tika do? What would, you know, that kind of, what would Dan do? You know, those kind of things because I, um, what is it, is the advantage. So I would figure out somehow you got to have, you've got to have somebody that can mentor you. You've got to be, and you, then you got to be coachable, you know, and be willing. Yeah. So I always ask, also tell people to ask for help, mm-hmm. you know, go, go, I mean, like, I mean, if, 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 uh, you know, 30 year old teacher came in up and coming and, and you know, they're, you know, in their second year working on the master's degree and start and said, Hey, can we meet? Once every couple of weeks for lunch, or and just mm-hmm. talk about stuff. I mean, who who's going to say no? <laughs> right. Of course. Right. Absolutely. Go ask somebody right. for help and and, right. and and start the conversation. I, I I think the reality of it though is how the, is as an administrator, I can I recognize administrative talent in teachers. Yeah. And sometimes it's like great teachers. Sometimes you either have it or you or you don't. And so no, I guess what I'm trying to say is no matter what kind of preparation, you can, it's going to help you, but it's not going to make you. Right. And I, mean, I know Cy Fair has had the, you know, the administrative um, school or, or, you know, um, I, don't, I can't remember the title for it, that, you know, that kind of preps you for what, what it would be like to, and gives you opportunity at a certain level to be in a, maybe a potential uh, administrator in their district and those kind of things. And there are things that workshops and things that you can go to, but the bottom line right. is, is how it happens typically is you are tagged. You know, I, I, I may be in the mailroom one day and say, you know, Diane, I said, have you ever thought about being in administration? And they may say yes or no. A lot of times they'll say no, and I'm the first one that says, you know, well, I recognize them because you are, and a lot of them are sponsors sure. or band directors yeah. or over people already. They're already doing it. I said, you know, have you ever thought about, it? maybe I to start working on it. I know you've only been teaching for three or four years, but maybe by the time, maybe 10 years, once you've had 10 years in or eight years in, then you've got that option. You may just, well, you know, I've never really thought about going to administration before. Then a lot of times they start thinking about it, and um, some of them are more c- the curriculum side of it. But you still ta- they're still tapped, and um, but what gets them prepared beyond that is just giving them opportunity. You know, allowing them to work in the office when an assistant principal's out. Right. You know, giving them side projects. You know, the building we're really looking at maybe this new, um, you know idea that to enhance our curriculum program in this area advanced academic strategy or something like that could you maybe you could kind of look in it and then make, they kind of become kind of a pseudo uh, administrator why they're still teaching and, and those kind of things but really that taking in as a as an as a teacher that wants to become an administrator or an assistant principal wants to become a principal the key word is to me is is initiative sure is taking initiative and, and asking what can I do for you for the campus and so forth? Yeah, yeah. You know, one, one of the things I want to talk about is, um, uh, before we finish up here, is um, uh, your ministry that you have on, uh, been ongoing. And so I didn't realize it went that far back. So you, this has been going on for a while now. So you have, um, now it's Suit Up Ministries. And prior to that, what, were you, what, what, was, the, what was going on before that? Was, because now is it is more like a men of, uh, you have a you focus. Yeah, it's, it's really always been, 
uh, primarily men's ministry, but it uh-huh. became nonprofit status in 2006. Okay. It became officially suit up right. ministries, and it basically is is based on uh, putting on the armor, putting on the light. You know, the night is nearly over, the dawn is almost here, so put away the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And so, you know, my path, again, I think the reason I'm in the position I'm in is more than, you know, a really bigger than just than being the principal. I think um, in my career as a teacher and a coach and an administrator, I've seen so much, just like you as a former band director, you've seen so much hurt in kids. Oh, yeah. And you've seen so many kids misbehave and not be successful. And, and at least 80% of the time, if you have conversations with them, it's because of the absentee father or no father at all. And I've been the benefactor of an absentee father t- many times over. I mean, I've walked girls across the field for homecoming. I've been a father-daughter. Day. I mean, I'm, I've benefited from it, but I, I, it's always an incomprehensible type of situations that a father would not be a part of their child's life. I mean, it's just um, unfathomable to me. And I can't even, even imagine um, not being a part of my son and daughter's life. And, you know, and, you know no way would I allow some other person to, to right. be there instead of myself. But I know there are circumstances. But to me, in the educational system, you know, I tell people my mantra is, in, on my ministry side, is that schools are not broken. The families, are, families are broken. And I talk about how schools are the reflection of the community, and the community are a reflection of the churches, and churches are a reflection of the families. And families are a reflection of the dad. So it all goes back. It it goes back to the responsibility of the man being the man and the dad, which I describe as daily active devotion, being the dad that that God calls us to be. And if we were, if men were the dads that they need to be, we, my job as a high school principal would be a lot easier. Oh yeah. I mean, because you know, if you just, I, I would, I would bet that any in-school suspension, if you started doing some data, and you interviewed those kids, survey those kids, and you just do, and, and one of the questions on there was, who do you live with, or you know, mm-hmm. and you put all that data together, chances are, eighty percent of them are going to are living in a single family home, and moms are doing amazing jobs. Thank goodness, this is no bash against single moms. Thank goodness that moms and aunties and grandmas or the women in these kids' lives are really, in most cases, the only stability they have. But both daughters and sons need their dad, too. And how powerful it would be if both of them were side by side, the way it's supposed to be, raising this kid. You know, here's what bothers me. Divorce is going to happen. I don't like it, but it's going to happen. But when you divorce your wife, why do you have to divorce your kids? That bothers me. Right. So, so the men's ministry is about equipping men for victory um, and uh, getting them suit up to be the dads uh, the, and be the men that God calls them to be. And I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of men out there, and uh, well, I'm going to say that don't have experience. Well, the, the, the truth is they don't, have a role, they don't have a role model. Of course you don't have experience. When a kid shows up into your world, it's like you have to— I remember, I remember bringing Lily home, my daughter and my wife, and and we, there we are, the three of us in the bed. I'm looking, I'm crying at this kid, thinking, "How am I going to keep this thing alive?" I don't even. What was yeah. I thinking? Yeah, I mean, it's just so overwhelmed. Like, what, yeah. I have no idea what to I, do. I think that's so. You know, I I remember just like you. I remember my daughter's 25 years old. I remember the the night, the day. I mean, I can't remember a lot of things, but I can remember the day we brought her home, and I'm literally, I'm laying in bed thinking, this is not a puppy. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is not something that you can put out in the garage or in the backyard when you're done. Right. This is some, when you're tired of it. You know, or This is, some, this is a, a life-long re- responsibility. This is, you know, and um, wow. But I, I think about how many kids come into the world where they don't have that, um, support. Yeah. And how do they, I mean, those kids are heroes. I mean, they are heroes that they come to school every day with things that they've dealt with things before the school's days even started that we can't even think about. Right. Can't even fathom. We have no idea. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't even know exists. No. And we, then we're trying to teach them. Right. 
and, and mad because they didn't bring the homework and you know, they didn't get their you know their project in on time. Yeah. So unbelievable, it really is. You know, and the and the, the role not just a especially that's why I always talk about men in the classroom. I'm telling you, you set it up like that. I'm the only one this kid has in his life. Yeah. I mean, I have to. I have to. I do that yeah. every time, and, yeah. and I think it's such a great way to. Um, uh, from a great place to teach if we really think about it like mm-hmm. that. I love that. I love that. So here's something, uh, maybe this, this will be our last thing today, is um, we have the school's good, man, we're going to kick it off. Here it comes. Kids are coming soon. We have another, another month, and next thing you know, man, new teachers coming into the building. And um, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I know you have uh, your full week of back to school staff development, and all this stuff, and I'm sure there's a district thing. And and um, the day before the kids come, there's probably a meeting in your school. You know, before the teachers get to work on their uh, mm. classrooms and all that stuff. What what ideas do you leave your teachers with? What are some things you have them think about? Knowing the kids are coming on Monday or mm. Tuesday or, or, or whatever it is. Oh, the Friday traditionally we always have what we call our working breakfast, uh-huh. and and cause so so we can let them go. You know, we work try to do you know some business and, but um, you know the the final word is is you know you it, it's important that you have your room ready. It's important that you have your lessons ready. You know, but um, you know you got to be there. You got to be there when, when that they're going to be excited. They're, at least <laughs> that first couple of days, they're excited. If nothing else, they're excited to see their friends. Yeah, you know. So let's let's take advantage of the opportunity to tap into that excitement to to make a, a connection immediately. So we so things can be um, you know lay that foundation for the rest of the year. You know, and, and from the very beginning, we're going to be talking about again. I get back to those three things. Uh, you know, or how, how am I going to communicate that every kid that walks in my door is valuable, is valued, and, and they are complete. They come fully prepared. Perfect. I mean, they have it. It's, you know, they may be looking around thinking they don't have the backpack that Johnny has or whatever, and I don't have the dress or the shoes or whatever, but you're complete. You don't need anything else. And then that they're loved. And so how are we going to do that? And, you know, and, and repetition, repetition, repetition on my part. Um, and to remind them on a regular basis. And that's what we're going to start on the very first day of school for 2013, 2014. It's powerful stuff. There's just more of it out there, man. I really do. Mm-hmm. It's great stuff that you have going on, man. Just so proud. So proud to know you and to have been um, been in your school. And I met some of your teachers. I still, I'm still friends with you know, some of your teachers that I've met. And just a great, great district. And I always say, if you're anywhere close to Magnolia, you ought to give uh, give Mr. Springer a call over at the, over at the high school yeah. and uh, just stop by and see, mm-hmm. just see, just to look around for 30 seconds and just feel it and see what's going on. Cause I think it'll change uh, the perception of, um, you know, when I, when I was a band director, I thought I was great until I went to Georgetown, Texas. Mm-hmm. And then I realized I, I, I didn't know. And I can't, I, di- I just didn't know. Sometimes we don't know. What I didn't know. know. Right. I couldn't be great until I, when I was a pal teacher, I thought I was great mm-hmm. until I met Chris Coble over at Cypher high school. Then I realized, oh, wait a minute, mm-hmm. <laughs> that that's great. And so, what what I'm suggesting is is just to come and, and uh, if you're ever in town, just to, just to, and and look it up online and do, and do some research and just and just find out a different way of doing things. And brother, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been awesome, man. It's been a blessing. I love you, man. I love you. Bring it up.